Jim, thank you all for coming. Um, I was scheduled to be fourth, then scheduled to be first, and so I'm now scheduled to be third. Um, those of you who have seen me speak here in Laser before know that I've been working for about 20 years on rigorous computer image analysis of paintings. I um, have published many uh, papers and books on the subject. I've taught courses in the computer science department here and in the art history department here on how to use computers to analyze paintings. <clears throat> This talk will not be nearly as technical as the other ones where I show lots of really cool math and 3D reconstructions of paintings and authentication and things like that. Instead, <clears throat> I want to talk about a problem that has plagued me and bothered me and annoyed me and frustrated me for decades, and that is the scourge, scourge of fake art. He who knows a thousand works of art <clears throat> knows a thousand frauds, says Horace. Well, the problem of fake art is far more widespread than people know. Um, these are uh, this painting sold for $25 million at Sotheby's until it was found out to be a fake made by a Chinese uh, painter in uh, Brooklyn. Um, there are whole conferences and uh, uh, exhibitions on fake art. Uh, there are techniques in Scientific American where I've published it as well on computer analysis of paintings and so forth. And what I want to get across today is just how extensive the problem is, and maybe a few steps on how we can start going towards it. And one thing that <clears throat> really uh, brought it home, I think, for many people was just um, in April of this year, a French museum discovered that more than half, more than half of its paintings were fake. And they discovered it uh, a number of ways. Um, uh, it turned out that some of the uh, signatures could just wash off easily, that some of the scenes that were depicted showed buildings that didn't exist when the painting was made, and lots and lots of techniques to find that, the, uh, that um, what was it, 82 out of 140 of these paintings were fake. And it was just one scholar who sort of chanced upon these that uh, started the ball rolling. Uh, and so there are now exhibitions from Orozco to Renoir, a new ex uh, exhibition uh, features fakes that fool the art world. So these are not things that fool the average person. They're ones that actually get into our canon, that are in books, that are on museum walls, and that are sold at auction and in uh, museum collections. And so um, here's Modigliani. Uh, <clears throat> here's a painting, a fake painting of something by Winslow Homer. This has great import to me. I once owned a major Winslow Homer painting that I sold at uh, auction at Sotheby's. And to know that there are fakes out there that are going to diminish the, the value of uh, art and our cultural heritage really annoys me. There's even whole museums of fake art, and this one in Germany. Um, and now for some definitions. So a fake or counterfeit art are works that are by someone's intention other than what they are presented to be. In some ways, they're sort of meant to fool someone. Misattributed is somewhat different. <clears throat> These are works that scholars or dealers attribute to an artist other than the true author. I hate that word, but that's the art historical term, the author, the person who made the actual painting. So this can be an honest mistake, or, or it could be deliberate. So um, a painting is found, a Renaissance painting, and they think it's by Titian, but it's not. And they say it's by Titian, so that's an honest mistake. Nevertheless, so it's a misattributed art. Nevertheless, we don't know, we have incorrect knowledge about who actually created it. Then, of course, forgeries are works deliberately created to fool viewers or dealers or purchasers of the authorship of the work that it uh, was supposed to be by uh, Salvador Dali, but it was by a woman in uh, south of uh, Florida. Uh, or unauthorized copies, works that are copied without the author's knowledge or approval. <clears throat> Um, and unattributed, these are paintings, I'm only going to talk about paintings, no sculpture today, uh, where there's no consensus assertion or attribution. We just don't know. And you'll go to museums, especially for ancient art, we, we don't know who the, uh, the artist was. So when you talk to art historians, <clears throat> the question of authorship is actually quite vexed. Does a work have to be directly and solely created by the author uh, to be genuine? Well, the consensus now in the art uh, community is no. 
And one of the best examples are some of these serographs or silk screens by Andy Warhol. He would be <clears throat> in the factory, his um, art studio, if you will, playpen in um, uh, New York City, and he would call uptown to say, ah, get this newspaper article, take a photograph of this photograph, of uh, this uh, page of the New York Times on page seven, make it this big, use this color, and so forth. And he would never even see it, never even see the work uh, until it was finally done, and then he would sign it. And the art community um, consensus is that that's an authorship work by Andy Warhol, even though he never touched it, he never saw it until it was done. The um, <clears throat> sort of philosophical underpinning is that it's the artist's unique intention. It was because of his ideas, because of his knowledge of working and his choice of the works and so forth. And of course, there are plenty of artworks that are from the workshop or the atelier of a given artist. So, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, Rembrandt needn't actually touch this, and we say it's from the school or from the atelier. And uh, sometimes the artist actually saw it and directed it, oh, do it this way, change this, um, or not. <clears throat> and then, of course, there are also works in which you have the master artist do some parts, and the atelier, the students, and the assistants do others. So it's, there's sort of a gray level, but my real concern is on the absolute fakes where something says, where someone says it's by person A, and it's not. One of my favorite forgers is Han van Meegeren, and I really think, if anyone's a, a uh, screenwriter, I think this person's life would be make an absolutely fantastic uh, movie. Um, he was a Dutch artist. Um, who was not recognized, he didn't feel he was recognized properly for his own talents, um, and wanted to get back at the art world, and he worked during World War II. He made many forgeries, especially, he was especially famous for painting Vermeers. I hope you all know uh, Johannes Vermeer, painted just 36 uh, works in his life, some of the greatest uh, paintings in the Western canon, Girl with a Pearl Earring, View of Delft, and so forth. But um, Van Meegeren, painted this Supper at Emmaus and tried to pass it off as by Vermeer. Now those of you who know art history, this does not look like Vermeer at all. How could some of the greatest art historians of the time, um, especially Dutch ones, who knew the Dutch Golden Age artists, call this the masterpiece of Vermeer, <laughs> the, best, the best one? Well, it's really quite interesting how he pulled it off. <clears throat> Partly, uh, the most interesting part for me, was how he fulfilled the expectations of the art community. If you know the early works by um, Vermeer, they're very religious. Um, allegory of faith, where he's holding, you know, uh, there are snakes, the serpents, and uh, Christ figures in the background, and so forth. And then the later works, which are very secular. Think of Girl with a Pearl Earring, or View of Delft, nothing religious about it. Why were there no transition paintings that go sort of halfway between the religious ones at the beginning and the other ones at the end. Well, this fulfilled that lacuna, that emptiness, if you will. You know, from the Bible, the Supper of Emmaus, this is where Christ comes back to his disciples and makes himself known. So it's sort of halfway between being religious and secular. Uh, you don't see any crosses or halos or anything like this. So on that aspect, it fulfilled it. Moreover, this was a time when uh, the Dutch were um, properly worried about how they were treating uh, the, the treatment of Jews at the time, so he just said, I got this from a, a Jewish uh, collector, and so that sort of swept, swept it through and made it easier for people to say, oh yes, of course we're going to take care of, of this collector who wants to remain anonymous, and so forth. So it fulfilled what discoverers wanted and scholars uh, sort of expected, and the discoverer, uh, first person who was sort of shown it, uh, worked in uh, near Delft in uh, later Rotterdam. Um, and of course, it's a great feather in your cap to be the discoverer of, a, of, of Vermeer. And so it, he fulfilled all of this. Um, well, Van Meegeren sold fakes uh, to the Nazis, including Hermann Goering, including this painting he sold to Hermann Goering. And so uh, later, uh, he was charged with collaborating with the Nazis, giving them uh, this great masterpiece. And so he was put in jail, and he um, 
protested wildly, wildly saying, uh, no, it wasn't by Vermeer, and nobody believed him. <laughs> he said, look at this, it's so great, you could never do that. And so, in prison, he painted another painting in the style of Vermeer, and exonerated himself until he could get out. <laughs> so there are lots of stories like that. Uh, here's another woman in Southern um, uh, California, a uh, truck driver who lived in a trailer, was walking by and wanted to buy a, uh, uh, went to a, a store and want, had, had just $5 and wanted to buy a present for a friend. They didn't have anything for $5, but this was in the, um, yard uh, by the, on the street near the, that store, and they, the person wanted $10 for it, and she said, I only have five, and she bought it for $5, and uh, later the high school art teacher walked by and said, um, you know, that might be by Jackson Pollock, and she said, who the fuck is Jackson Pollock? She had no idea, and there's a whole long uh, documentary about whether this is actually by um, Jackson Pollock, and she was offered, I think it was $3 million for it, and much more than she'd ever made, uh, and she turned it down, and, and there's a long story about finding a thumbprint that might be by Jackson Pollock on the back, and so forth. But my view, and I think the scholarly view, is that this is not by Jackson Pollock. But here's another interesting, very weird case, which was uh, just recently. Um, Peter Doig is a, is a uh, Canadian painter, <coughs> And a, uh, a, a man, a, a Canadian corrections officer, someone who worked in a prison, had a painting that was by Peter Doig, D O I G E, and that he, there are records, he bought it for $100. And if it was by Peter Doig, D O I G, it would be worth maybe $10 million. <laughs> and he wanted to sell it, um, and he needed to get the real artist Peter Doig's. Um, approval to say, yeah, I, I painted it. And the artist said, I didn't make it. Mm -hmm. So the corrections officer took him to court. He went to the artist and said, prove you didn't paint this painting. <laughs> and he finally did, but uh, so it wasn't by Peter Doig at all. And he got off, but that he had to, uh, was under legal pressure, forced by the court to prove that he didn't paint a painting attributed to him. Or, um, here's Gauguin's Vase de Fleur, Days of Flowers, in May 2000, both an authentic version of this and a copy were simultaneously offered for sale by Sotheby's and Christie's auction houses. On the same, the, the catalogs came out the same day, both selling the same painting. Imagine they had been offset by three months. Yeah. Whoever was second would of course pulled it back and kept everything quiet. And I, I know the people that Sotheby's who sold my painting, and Christie's and so forth. Um, they are very care they try to be very careful, but every once in a while, uh, things get through. So which artists are the most faked? Well, that we know of. <laughs> of course, we don't, really don't know. Uh, Giorgio de Chirico, uh, Camille Corot. Corot is an interesting case. Scholars believe that he painted about 3,000 paintings in his lifetime. There are 5,000 of them in the United States. Uh, Salvador Dali, uh, Gomier, Van Gogh has often been uh, copied and, and faked, and so forth. Amadeo Modigliani, and so forth. The only American is uh, Frederick Remington. So how extensive is the problem? We have all these anecdotes, and over 50% of art is fake, says Art News, which is a reputable case. The answer is really, nobody really knows. Uh, and I'll tell you why nobody knows in a little while. But Thomas Hoving, the ex-director, the former director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, it was on the committees that had to review paintings uh, and other works, sculptures too, that uh, uh, were examined for possible purchase by the Met. And he claimed that 40% of the ones coming to the Met were fake. Well, this is the Met, and I've spent many hours, and I know many of the people at the Met, and they are extremely careful, and they are so forth. You wonder about the other museums. Are they having the same kind of vigilance and careful vetting of works uh, that the Met does? Maybe not. So I've spoken to uh, very important major uh, art scholars in museums and um, uh, research centers for art, and the average 
<clears throat> of these expert judgments is that on museum walls, 20% are fake or misattributed. Now, if you just think of the monetary value of that, that's over a trillion dollars. A trillion. Um, or, and these numbers in the commercial art market swing wildly, <laughs> but it might be somewhere between 40 and 60% of the commercial art, art market, uh, hundreds of billions per year <clears throat> worldwide. So why is there so much fake art? Well, what are the motivations? It's often, there are disgruntled or underappreciated artists who try to get into the art world, honestly, if you will, and um, fail and get snubbed many times, um, and they want to get back. They explicitly want to get back and uh, snub their noses at the art community, and some of them have laid on their deathbeds basically said, ha, 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 look at this this one, here's my painting in the Louvre, here's my painting in the Met, here's my painting in MoMA. There are others who are not. This is Mark Landis, who's an incredibly prolific uh, uh, forger and faker, has um, thousands of paintings in the United States museums. Um, he clearly, if you ever see him on vi in videos and so forth, he um, clearly isn't trying to aggrandize himself or get back at anyone. It's just his way of making um, art and giving it as gifts to other people who then donate them to museums. Uh, and there are unethical and unscrupulous dealers. There are some political groups who want to undermine the cultural heritage of other uh, cultures and so forth. But there are also art market inefficiencies. Ways, you know, if you, if you play the stock market, that is a highly efficient um, uh, economic system, a highly efficient market. If you want to buy, I don't know, Google stock, um, and uh, you don't get it at this price, well, you can wait a little while and get it at another price. Um, but in the art market, you have unique items. There are no alternatives. If you want to get this Rothko painting and you don't get it, there's no alternative. You can't turn and get something else. There's often, almost always a single dealer per work that if you want to buy a Rothko, you've got to go to Marlboro in New York or whatever the thing is. Um, this prevalence of fakes that are, that are rampant. The, there's often a reliance on a single authority for pricing. That is to say, the, the dealer uh, sets the price for this Vermeer, or, well, no, the Vermeers don't get sold, uh, Monet, um, and you have to go with that person's uh, 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 estimation, take it or leave it. Uh, there are also reliance on single authorities for authentications. Is it genuine? Uh, and they sometimes have conflicts of interest. If you are a gallery owner, um, you are very eager to have this painting that you bought for $10,000 to be a genuine Perot or something like that. Likewise, sellers have more knowledge about what will come onto the market. You really want to buy this Rothko, and the dealer isn't telling you that next month there'll be an even better one coming uh, next month. And this is one of the largest unregulated markets uh, on the planet. There's no equivalent of the Federal Trade Commission, and there's a long history of the art community pushing back, how are you going to judge quality of this, why is this painting more than this, get out of your government, and so forth. So how does one identify a fake? <clears throat> um, here it's from Thomas Hoving's book, wonderful book. Uh, he has 11 rules of thumb. First impressions, the, inst the, the snap judgment, thinking slow and fast, the, the quick instant um, uh, impression, and he's very famous for the uh, Getty Kuroi, Ku, uh, Kuroi the um, uh, male sculpt, uh, sculpture that, uh, I forget, it was 25 years ago, sold, uh, was bought for, uh, I think, uh, $12 million, and he walked in and instantly said, he said, no, just no, like that, and they did all these uh, studies, and indeed, it turned out not to be uh, uh, genuine. Uh, then write a pedantic description. Try and be as careful and meticulous about describing the medium, the work, the, uh, everything about it, and it's also its condition. You know, if it's supposed to be really old, then the condition of the work, there should be dust on there, dirt on it, and so forth, and the, uh, the support, the fabric, and so forth, the uh, uh, canvas, and so forth, should be worn, and so forth. Ask how it was used. Was this on the wall of some... Um, palace for a long time? If so, how would the physical aspect of it have been changed? Determine if the condition backs up how it was used. 
look at the style. Is it homogeneous or varied? Um, do this style and the supposed date agree? Assemble dates and prov it's called provenance, the documentary record of this sales, sales of work. Turns out this is very easy to forge and fake, just documents um, and signatures and so forth. Likewise, check published records, look at catalogs that were years ago. And the one that interests me most and irks me was rigorous scientific analysis. He says, do every possible scientific test you can on the work and then discard them all. Well, uh, he wrote this, his, this list, uh, I think about 20 years ago. Science has really come a long way, and I'll talk, give you a little hint about things later. And then street talk, things like, what are people saying on the street? Oh, I heard through the grapevine. Um, one of the uh, greatest founders of the field of uh, con scientific connoisseurship was Giovanni Morelli, who um, uh, helped to identify artists by uh, attributes of their work, how they uh, painted fingers and hands and ears and so forth. He was actually trained as a medical doctor, and so his training on how to look for diseases, he then transferred over to diagnose, if you will, and understand how uh, uh, artists work. Now some of the scientific methods involve microscopy, looking at uh, materials, mass spectrometry, there's a lot of work on pigment, there's the Pigmentium project out, out of uh, Oxford, where you have records of uh, actual samples of the kinds of pigments that were used in 1629. And if you find a pigment that was uh, in a painting that's supposed to be before then, but it only was um, made afterwards, uh, you know that's fake and so forth. Infrared reflectography, ways of seeing underneath the layers, <coughs> and that the, the working method of an artist, a copyist, will often take a painting and just copy the, what he sees on the surface, but an actual artist often has so-called underdrawings or pentimenti that show how he worked and developed the image, and that will not be visible in a copy once you do infrared reflectography. I've been working for many years on digital image analysis using computers to um, uh, study brush strokes and marks and so forth. Here's some uh, work on uh, uh, authentication of Peter Bruegel's etchings by looking at uh, wavelet analysis. I won't go through the details, but it's looking at basically the structure of the the actual marks uh, in the etchings. Dendrochronology, um, that's on wood supports, uh, like the uh, panels that the um, Mona Lisa are on. You can date wood by look, counting the rings and comparing them to other existing ones. It's a really interesting one, bomb radioactivity. After Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there's enough strontium in the atmosphere that you can detect it in paints that were made after 1948. And so if you find uh, a, a painting that was supposed to be 1920, but it has this radioactive um, uh, signature, you know it was fake. <clears throat> so here you can look at uh, the actual marks of someone like uh, Matisse in this case, and do computer image analysis of the shapes and the forms and the thickness and so forth uh, in order to tell the difference. I've uh, written a number of papers on authenticating genuine Jackson Pollocks from fake Jackson Pollocks by looking at um, tech, basically texture analysis, looking at the structure of these. It's net, none of these things are 100%. Um, they give us better than chance, and this can be used as a part of a whole sequence of um, measurements and uh, analyses of hidden paintings in order to tell. Some of this has been done online. There's this, uh, a painting was stolen and detected uh, online by using computer image techniques. And here are some of the checks and lacks of checks on the art world. Um, part of a check is that auction houses usually have a two-year guarantee. You bought a painting from Sotheby's, and if it's found out that uh, within two years that it's uh, fake or misattributed, you get your money back and a little interest. Unfortunately, scholars are reluctant to make judgments. This one really makes me sad as a scholar and former professor and so forth, that experts who really know a subject, as an artist, are scared to make statements about it because they get sued for what's called defamation of property. You own a painting that you claim is by um, Van Gogh and worth $100 million. I'm a world expert on Van Gogh, and I say it's not. Now it's worth $10,000. You sue me. And um, even the College Art Association is discouraging their members from getting into these. Things. Um, an interesting force is collectors and museums. Imagine I'm a wealthy collector and I have 10 paintings Two, and you're a museum, and there's a 
Monet and uh, Sicily, really valuable paintings. And then there are eight others that really aren't that good. I want to donate them to you and get the tax write-off on all of them. You really only care about these. You have, no imp you have no motivation to check these other ones if they're fake or not. Because if you do, you come back and say, David, this one we think is fake. I'll say, okay, thanks, and I'll give them to that museum uh, instead. So there's a force preventing the discovery of the fakes. There is the International Foundation for Art Research, which has set up a, a way in which you can try and do these kinds of med, uh, judgments without being sued. It only goes so far. Uh, these are done by artists' foundations. There's the Warhol Foundation, many foundations that are um, uh, set up to do the authentication. And then, of course, there are internet uh, there are appraisers. But why does this matter? Often I get from people who know nothing about art, say, you know, if I like it, what's wrong with that? You know, it looks pretty good. Oh, the difference is really small. Well, first of all, there's the value in the museums, just raw value, and the commercial art market. But it's really our cultural history and patrimony, understanding the true creations of the masters who made, made these kinds of works. Also, I'm very interested in keeping our eyes trained um, and our minds and having, developing visual intelligence to be able to uh, tell the difference. And just, just the love of truth and finding what's absolutely right. It's also affecting the, mark, the art market. More than half of London's galleries are failing, and a lot of this has to do with online stuff, where the um, fakes are much more rampant, and just the economics of it. What do we do? Well, I really don't know, but here are some ideas. The first thing is we've got to alert the art-loving public. You know, whenever, whenever I'm at a cocktail party, I get on my high horse, and people have no idea just how widespread this, this problem is. What I'd love to do is get accurate estimates of the extent of the problem. You'd have to do some sort of really good polling of world experts because they're scared of coming out and saying, oh, that painting over there in the Metropolitan, I'm sure that's not. They're not going to say that. So how do you find that out? And I must say, once I started getting into this, I, I'm looking with far greater skepticism at works. And I was at the... Um, Museum of Modern Art in Rome, and I turned a corner and looked at a painting and read the thing. I couldn't stop myself. I just said, no frigging way allowed, because I would bet a year's salary that that painting is misattributed. Mm -hmm. I think we also need to reinstitute connoisseurship in the academy. This is completely, those in the art community think this is retrograde, old fashioned, and so forth, but um, I think it's really essential that we get back to careful viewing of, uh, of artworks. I also think we need to change these libel laws so that bona fide scholars can s render opinions and not worry that their whole life and careers are going to go up uh, in smoke. And what I've been doing for the last 20 years is develop better scientific methods. So with that, I'll thank you very much. <laughs>